imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. With your host, Conan Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rock about music, rock and roll, and corporate power. The thing is, though, if you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree with shot and nail. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Confidence of a hero or a fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. It's so- It means something. You know, that's my take on it. Like, what's yours? Protonic reversal! That's like a science thing, right? Indeed. 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 It is a science thing. It is a science place. It is a scientific fact that we are all up in your face. It is time for the one, the only... Protonic Reversal. Welcome to it. Welcome, everybody. We got a hell of a guest for you tonight. I just wanted to chime in and say, uh, hey, it's it's uh, great getting all the positive feedback from the show. Thanks, everybody, for all the nice things said about uh, recent episodes and folks sharing it around and, and rating and reviewing and stuff. All that stuff's annoying as hell. <laughs> but... Uh, it helps. Uh, it helps the show grow, and it's it, it's really appreciated from my my side of things. So normally, um, yeah, normally we would uh, you know play some music or something along those lines, but we're just, we're just gonna get right to it. I, I'm really excited to talk to this guy. This is a uh, Shannon Selberg. This is Shannon's like one of the great kind of weird rock frontmen, if you will, and and it's a lot more than just that. Uh, known predominantly for his work in the cows, uh, amazing band, um, uh, post-hardcore noise rock band, just a pack of weirdos, however you want to call it, from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. But also the underrated Heroin Sheiks, really, really cool band, the Heroin Sheiks. So really excited to talk to this guy. You don't get to hear from uh, Shannon Selberg that much. So uh, I hope you guys are as excited about this as I am. And if not, we'll get excited. Because uh, this guy's a, he's a quaka. He's a quaka, as they say. I don't know who says that, but uh, whoever says that, they would say it on this show. Uh, really excited to talk to Shannon Selberg. And yeah, t- we'll, we'll talk some cows. I think it's going to be a, a, a good time. So again, ProtonicReversal.com for the archives for everything. We're on all the social medias and things along those lines. On the line with us right now, we have Mr. Shannon Selberg. Shannon, welcome, man. Well, thank you, Mr. Newton. We're doing it. We're doing it. We're I'm doing right. a show. I'm back in showbiz, baby. All right. a, this is it. This is the path back. Exactly. It starts with starts with Protonic Reversal, and then it ends up on Broadway. That's, I think that's the exact path, right? Well, you ought to be my agent or something. <laughs> I suppose you could do worse. <laughs> you could do a lot worse, oh. actually. <laughs> well, we'll see. All right. <laughs> how are you? How are you dealing with? Uh, quarantine and the the general hellscape that is, that is the world man how's shannon selberg dealing oh i'm always fine i'm always good yeah I, I never really hung out in the house i got a job and i gotta go out to it so. it's all good i mean uh i was I, I wasn't being very social uh before that and i've continued on my streak so yeah <laughs> Can, it's all this, good the streak continues unabated <laughs> Yes. Has it? But I'm sure we're going to have a nice chat. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I think the the thing I, I kind of want to start with is has the enduring legacy of the cows been uh, something that was like, is that a surprise? Like, is it something that you, it's a band that people find out about every year and they kind of tell their friends about it. And, and, and as much as maybe it wasn't like a bankable thing necessarily like there's there's an enduring legacy with the discography that people really are attached to and that have brought in a bunch of new fans younger fans things along those lines uh coming from the perspective of a guy that was in it is it is that something that uh you know do you do you interact with these like newer fans and stuff do you do you ever think about it at all i mean what's what's the legacy of the cows like for shannon 
Um, well, before I was in the cows and during the cows and the heroin sheiks, and even now I'm kind of a in the moment person. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff happens to you every day and you live in that day and you don't look back. And so for a lot of years, I figured, well, now when I was in the band, I'm doing this. And then I did stuff after that. And now I'm doing what I do now. And, but then I, a couple months ago, I got back on Facebook. I never really did it much. And I was like, wow, this, uh, this stuff means something to people and I'm never going to outrun it. And, uh, Maybe outrun it is the wrong word, but yeah, I mean, I was really proud of what I did and I worked on it really hard and, and it was, we actually designed the music to be kind of timeless. Yeah. We didn't want to be of an era, so it, it's sort of designed. So 10 years from now, 20 years, 30 years, there's stuff, there's, you know, if you listen hard, there's new layers to it that you didn't know and, uh. Some of the songs are double, triple entendre songs. And there's a lot of <laughs> right, yeah. sort of musical musical jokes inside of there that you know, you know it's designed for casual listening or just rocking out, or if you want to sit and examine it, you can do that too. Well, and it's it's something where I do feel that the Heroin Sheiks were actually a pretty underrated band. Uh, and, well, I, and kind of I has would naturally agree, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and but I think one of the reasons uh, that I think maybe people didn't latch onto it as much though is just because the cows sort of loomed large, and that's almost like people don't talk about the burden of success when it's you know punk rock success necessarily. But it, it's it's is it something that. You know, was that a thought when you're when you're doing heroin cheeks? Because it's you know it's a different kind of band, but it isn't different in such a way that it's uh, you know uh, Miles Davis versus the Rolling Stones necessarily. It's it's a you know it's ultimately like it was a interesting thinking man's rock band. I would I would say, or just rock it out. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, I was just doing what. It, See, the thing is about the cows is that when we came together, we were really nobodies in the scene. And I kind of, Kevin and Thor and Kevin's brother Sandris were playing in this band that they all worked at a home for, um, they called it mentally retarded children back then. And on holidays, (laughs) on holidays, they would get up and play. And sort of on a lark, they decided to try playing the Uptown Bar or the 7th Street entry. And uh, what Run Westy Run got us in there, and uh, or got them in there. And Norm Rogers was actually the singer back then. And he was very nervous on stage. And I got to thinking, you know, if these guys had a monkey hopping around in front of them, this thing could really take off. <laughs> well, yeah, and a lot of people don't realize that. that yeah, the, the, the fellow's... The- on drums is originally was was the singer, and I think part of it's because you uh, you you cut such a large figure uh, in the tradition of the great front people. You know, of course, dating back to like you know the Stooges and then like Iggy or something along those lines. That uh, it, it was a show. It it almost was, uh, you know, uh, not not vaudeville necessarily, but like coming from like the great the great shows of big rock, but it's done on a much smaller level uh at like a club level and it made a very engaging presence because it's like oh what's it you know what's it going to be tonight you know what's he going to be up to like oh my god who knows well what my what i thought of my job as being wasn't to be some sort of great front man it was that our music was designed that you have to live it in the moment each individual tick tock you have to be absolutely present my job was to put people off balance so that they would actually, their minds could not wander off and they would have to, eventually they would have to live in the moment. They really didn't have any choice. And the thing about the cows is when, you know, we had different drummers and they were all great, but when me and Kevin and Thor made music together, it was just a chemical reaction. I mean, our practices were actually crazier than our live shows. And we oh, wow. practice three, four <laughs> times a week, three, four times a week. And it was, you know, for hours on end. And that's just how we got our rocks off. I mean, it was, 
you know, we we go out to take a leap between songs and the rest of the whole practice rooms would be outside of our door with their mouths hanging open. Like, who the hell are you guys? <laughs> What's going on in there? Well, yeah, and I think that's interesting because I think to the to the layperson that maybe isn't paying that close attention, they would, you know, it it almost seemed like it would be like improv or something. But the more you pay attention to it, it's almost like hyper constructed. Like it's very it, all of the. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember seeing like a sticker on a record that all distortions intentional, and it's sort of like all <laughs> musical shenanigans where it seemed to be intentional with the compositions and the fact that even if it was the audience was limited to the people playing the music you know, you were inviting people into this weird world that you were creating. And it's interesting you mentioned that. Well, I've always had two theories about people who make that kind of music. There are rebels and there are aliens. <laughs> now, rebels rebels are trying to overthrow the system because they would rather that they were on top of it. Yeah. And they'll disappoint you almost every time. Whereas aliens, like, say, Marquis Smith and bands like that, they... They form their own separate world, and they invite you in. We were more like that. And I also think it's it's all the more interesting when you mention the kind of keeping the audience in the moment by just not knowing what to expect less. You, you get less of the analytical brain of someone saying, well, parts of this remind me of Captain Beefheart, and then there's certain parts that remind you know, yeah. where they're like do, doing this internal math in exactly. their head and like, you know, writing an internal review even just for themselves and more just like, what what's happening right now? Like, I feel uncomfortable or excited or excitedly uncomfortable. Yeah, a lot of people describe an experience seeing us where the first time they saw us, they absolutely thought we were the worst band that could possibly <laughs> exist. And maybe they got dragged to a second show and maybe halfway through it, all of a sudden, like something flipped or snapped inside of them and they got it. They got it. So, and can you tell me about the, the musical evolution? Uh, so when it, when it starts off... Um, with, with the cows, you know, those those guys are already going. What are you bringing into it? Now, obviously, you, you've you not just singing, you play instruments, you've brought in, uh, you know, bugle, trumpet, trombone, like brass instruments, which are almost considered, you know, outside of the, the dreaded ska word are not, uh, not usually uh, uh, allowed in rock and roll music. It, well, I'll tell you how that happened, though. Um, See, we would, usually how we wrote a song is Kevin would come up with the bass riff and then the chemical reaction would start and, and it, it would be a great riff. And then Thor, Thor and Kevin, if you notice on Kyle's songs, never play anything even related to each other. So what's going on there is that Thor is trying to steal the song. And so I would let those two find their equilibrium and then I would try to steal the song. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because they're, they're, it's fighting for attention. There are these these competing lines that are, are interesting and hooky and cool. And it, it, it's it's as a listening experience, you know, even outside the live show, it's something where you can listen to the same song and kind of hear different things out of it, depending on uh, which particular piece of member you're uh, focusing in on. And it, it's something where. It didn't seem like people... The layers. Were, yeah, it layered, exactly. It wasn't exactly like people were trying to outdo each other, but it was, you know, a little bit uh, you know, fighting for... to do something cool in the limited amount of space and, and almost like packing it in like a, like how you have orange juice concentrate, right? You have like a... <laughs> yes. With, like musical with, concentrate. With a pulp-like substance, yes. <laughs> right, exactly. So you can choose it with pulp or without pulp. Uh, well, I think we were competing. And, you know, as far as that goes... Kevin would come up with a bass riff and the drummer and Thor would fight it out and I would listen. And, and sometimes Kevin would be working that riff for an hour or two before, you know, I didn't have a part yet. And I, so I complained to Kevin, Kevin, I'm getting bored. I don't have nothing to do where you guys do that. He says, and he looked around the room and at his apartment and he saw a bugle laying there and he handed it. Well, <laughs> well here, play that stupid. It was just like that. So it was, it was just <laughs> laying around the room at the time, and, it, and that, that's, that was the... Yeah. Here, yeah, he threw it at me, and he said, here, play that. How's that? Now you have something to do. <laughs> had you, have you, did you have any experience with brass instruments before? Oh, no, never, no. Well, <laughs> I, I played a bugle. 
Yeah. And a bugle is nothing but a brass kazoo, basically. <laughs> right, there's, there's not a lot of musicality to it. Uh, if you imagine, you know, if you pucker your lips up, something's going to come out. And, yeah, well, you know, the yeah. first album, we we I played the trombone on that because there was one of those laying around, but I had no idea what I was doing. And But I learned over time, and I got pretty good eventually. I mean, we practiced for hours on it. And we did another thing when we didn't, we couldn't write any songs and we get stuck. We would just play a couple hours of free jazz, which is, you know, it can be the lamest thing in the world or it can be really good. But (laughs) what what would happen is, 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 you know, everybody has a lot of bad ideas stored up inside of them and we just blow them all out and playing bad jazz, basically. <laughs> well, so, and, and of course, you're talking about the, the first record, uh, uh, Taint Plurbius, Taint Unum, which you have the the cover of the, uh, how, how do you say it? Kuyana's Ky- Ky- Kwati, the, uh, that film? That, that Kuyana Scotsi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I butcher that. Which is a, like, it's Philip, that's a Philip Glass composition, if I remember correctly, right? I mean, that's... Yeah. Bold, oh, bold way funny. to start, to I, start I, out the record. I had a girlfriend. <laughs> Hold on, I... I I had a girlfriend who was like a a modern dancer and she was so good that she got into like one of the top dance companies in America and eventually they ended up going on a tour where Philip Glass played live and she gave him she she actually played it for Philip Glass. No kidding. <laughs> really? So that yeah, then, yeah. then one has has to wonder He what said he liked reaction. it. Well, oh well, geez, yeah, he said it was awesome. pretty cool. <laughs> but I mean, it's like when you start off with a, you know, a, a, a reinterpretation of an avant-garde composition. It's almost like a statement of intent that, like, maybe what you what you're going to hear from this band is a little bit different than, uh, you know, your average, uh, your average rock band. And well, that was just a matter of I used to go see that movie when it was in the theaters on acid, and it really blew me away. So I really <laughs> wanted to play it. <laughs> it. I mean, it's a good movie. It's it's a. Yeah, you know, it's it's an uh, interesting soundtrack and an interesting movie. So it's, I mean, it's, when you were doing all this practicing and you're putting together these kinds of compositions and things like that, like, was it, were there any, like, rules at all? Was it like, okay, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to keep this to this amount of time or we're going to go this direction or whatever uh no actually the first several years we played and i've told this story before and i'm not advocating it obviously but uh we would take a little bit of acid and go to practice and just make an ungodly racket for hours on end and it was the greatest uh there was uh, no there was no rules whatsoever (laughs) now kevin would come up with the baseline and then there would be a beat, and then Tor would come over the top, and I would think about it for a while and try to split the difference somehow. And, you know, I want to be the part where people go home humming, not those two. Yeah, yeah. And like that. <laughs> so, and that's a, that first It was record, intellectual yeah. and brutish at the same time, you see. Yeah, yeah. Intellectually brutish. But, no, it was very unselfconscious stuff. It was, uh, in fact, we were... We were so uh, into what we did, and we could feel it. And yeah, we pretty much. This was in a period when the replacements in Husker Du were getting kind of mature and doing more poppy stuff and more grown up stuff. And we said, "Can I swear on the air?" I didn't. Yeah, ask you, 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 you absolutely. It's the internet, so you can. Yes. Oh, so yeah, we just basically uh, a couple of us walked into our folk and said, "You know." We're the cows, and uh, we're uh, who's gonna do in the replacements? Uh, no, we're taking over, see? And I'm like, who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, but he was the guy who had put out our first album, so it must have worked. He said, "Oh, his response was, you know, you guys have only played three shows, and everybody who comes in here either thinks you're the best thing they ever saw or the worst possible band ever." So yeah, right away it, it started. Yeah, because it, it's it's cows seem to evoke a strong reaction one way or the other, and I th- I think one of the things that is most sad about a lot of bands these days is that there's a pl- there's plenty of stuff that it's fine, you know that's okay, it's all right, you know it's not it's not bad, it's not it's not amazing, it's kind of like somewhere in the middle, and 
the fact it that was it, like that back then, you know. <laughs> well, for sure, but there's just there's more of everything now. So I think it's interesting that you would. Yeah. I mean, it seemed like you would get the either the most exuberant or the most vicious reactions, as well as people that were just you know uh, excitedly confused or confusedly excited. Uh, along the lines. Right, and we really didn't care less. I mean, it is what it is. If they like it. Well, see, the thing that happened, though, was that we played our first maybe two or three shows in a club, and we kind of had a bad end of meeting. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they were trying to, you know, they are saying, well, Shannon, this was fun and everything, but I don't know if it's anything we're going to pursue. And I said, now, listen, here's the thing. We're really good. And, you know, I don't know how good we are for real, but here's the thing. If we keep doing this, we're going to make records and we're going to tour. And the guys in your record collection, we're going to meet them and they're going to be our friends. And they, you know, they looked at me like I was crazy, but yeah, we'll give it a little while longer. Yeah. I mean, and it, and it, you know, it, it, it did turn out I, i'm i'm interested but and i want to i want to move on to the other records as well but what was the that first record is is just bonkers sounding like how how was the recording process for that i mean what 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 well, what was a, the recording process for that well the story was is that the uh mark trios and his partner john they found a studio for us and it turned out to be out in the suburbs and it was at a guy's house and the guys who lived there were a couple of hippies that had just bought a whole bunch of recording equipment, and we were the first band that they had ever recorded. Wow. <laughs> so <laughs> we showed up, and we were on some stuff, and and we didn't do it to be wise guys or anything, but anyway, and we ended up that afternoon, we tore a bunch of branches off of a tree in his front yard, and I had got out and bought a couple of steaks and sliced them into pieces, and we roasted them over a fire in their front yard on his driveway. <laughs> on and the driveway. So, <laughs> nice. And they hadn't even heard us play. So then we started playing, and they just freaked out, and they, as, as I heard it, they never they they decided to go out of the music business after us. <laughs> <laughs> One way or the other, you ruined them from it, huh? <laughs> yes. If that's what this is going to be, uh, no, we got to figure something else out. <laughs> so, but it, but it made for a very interesting, iconic record. But it, I think that uh, it seems it's fr- from the outside because I came to you guys uh, a little bit later. But it seemed like Daddy has a tale, sort of where. Uh, I th- that's the one. I think it's the first one that Tom put out, right? That that's the one that. Uh, yeah. It's uh, it's it, things. It, it's considered a, a more good entry level recording, um, but it's got it's got a different vibe. But it, it's more just a well. And again, you start off with a almost statement of intent composition, right? You have that like well, that bat that badass cover of uh, 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 Johnny Kin the Pirates, the, the shaking all over. Well, when we made that, when we made Taint Pluribus Taint Unum, we'd only been a band for a few months. So, you know, we grew a little bit over the course of the year or two before, between that and Daddy as a tail. We kind of found our, our groove and uh, took it took it from there. But yeah, it was, uh, and we switched drummers, I believe, between those two records. And uh, yeah, that, that changes things a little bit too. It, it does. Yeah, that was Tony that was on that one, right? So I... Yeah. Did you? Uh, so, how did you end up hooking up with Tom? I mean, Tom, I think knew Kevin already, uh, like, right? If I remember correctly, but because I've had him on the show as well. But how did you? How did he, you end up putting out the record? He and Tom lived across the street from each other, and we wanted to go a different way than Trio's records wanted to go. So uh, we shopped it around a little bit, and uh, Touch and Go turned us down. They said, uh, these songs all sound like waltzes. No thanks. And, uh, <laughs> like, really? Waltzes, eh? Wow. But, that's, I mean, if you're, if you're going to get turned down, at least have it be befuddling, I guess. that's a. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it might even... Uh, nah, uh, I remember it as being signed by Steve Albini, but I'm sure that's not true. So. <laughs> Uh, so okay, so you bring your waltzes to Hazelmeyer, and then uh, and he obviously d- he digs it. 
Um, uh, so uh, yeah, then Kevin came and told us all that uh, Hazelmeyer wanted to record us, and yeah, it sounded like a great idea because you know we're we uh, you know I think first we did almost a god on uh, dope guns and fucking in the streets, yeah, yeah. and that great. turned out pretty good, and and uh, so yeah, then we yeah we hooked up with Amrit because they would do it. I mean, from my point of view, and keep in mind, everybody out in listener land, that all of this is just coming from me. Kevin and Thor would have very different ideas about how everything went down and happened because uh, we're just really different people. That's all. Well, yeah. So that's one of the things that was so interesting with the cows is that you had these very, uh, very different, very, very talented, but very different personalities, and it, it came together for this uh, really frenetic hole but it was, it, it was a it was a chemical reaction that happened yeah. when we played we didn't know how it happened or why it happened but it happened it was it was crazy yeah it, was, it felt really good to play that music you have no idea and, and <laughs> better was, than sex <laughs> and was working with david for with the god Billies, that that was that was good did you did you feel like he was a good dude to work with professionally there uh, well, yeah, he's a really good friend of ours to this day. I just chatted with him a few days ago, actually. And, uh, yeah, he's a good guy. I think we mixed it in his basement. And if I remember right, he actually, ex- it accidentally got put on videotape instead of recording tape or some kind of thing. So we, wow. <laughs> had to, we had to completely remix the whole thing. Oh man. That's a, and like a day. That's, that's. Wow, that's some that's some mistake. <laughs> that's, uh, so, so in, so interesting. So that the, so do you feel that the mixes that are on the record? Uh, I mean, do you, do you like them? Like, do do you think it's a good representation of those those songs, those recordings? Mm, I guess so. I mean, I really, I really don't think about it that way. But uh, I'm, I, you know, all of our albums, I figure everybody did the best they could. Because with our, you know, the first album was just what it is. It was, I mean, we're just a bunch of like dumb animals. But after that, it was, uh, you know, uh, it was all the recording things were different, and uh, I'm not really into the whole recording process, so. I'm a, I'm a live plan guy. That's yeah. all I really care about is I, I, I just like getting in front of people and doing that stuff. But, uh, but uh, yeah, they would be much more uh, informative about the whole recording process. And I, I figure everybody did their best. Everybody tried to capture our live sound. And, and uh, until we did the last one, sorry, in Pig Minor with Buzz, he mm-hmm. said, uh, you guys, I'm going to approach this completely differently. Uh, I believe that when you make a record, uh, the record should be the record and that's it. If there's, you know, overdubs on the record that aren't in their life, if they've listened to the record, they'll in their head, they'll hear that anyway. It doesn't matter. So we're going to make, you know, some three, four minute songs. And he had us cut out some parts actually. Nobody even suggested that to us before and you know we cut out whole verses and changes in a couple of songs and uh yeah it was a good idea yeah it was a whole different approach that's why it sounds so different and and uh but everybody was fun to work with yeah he was well and buzz is coming but, out from the perspective of being a fan too like he was a big fan of what you guys did and and you know like see, like from my- Go ahead, sorry. From my perspective, in the recording studio, what tended to happen is the first night we would come in drunk and thinking that we could nail everything. And <laughs> so all those were pretty useless takes. And then uh, we, had to, we had to make the records in three or four days. So, okay, scratch the first day. And then we'd have to go back. And then Kevin's turning up. And then Thor's turning up. And then Kevin's turning up. And then uh, we're recording it. And then uh, a few times, every once in a while, we'd have to, you know, the the engineer would just turn all the switches down and, all right, start over. <laughs> By the time they got around to me, I only had one or two takes to do everything, usually, in the studio. So to me, it was just a nerve-wracking, like, am I going to 
have time to do a couple of takes or well, what. So, and, and you've hit on something important because I think it's, I think you had a, a really interesting way of fitting in a, a lot of ideas and a lot of interesting lyrics into, um, I mean, chaotic isn't the wrong word, but into an environment that, like, you, it, it seems like some of them, some of the songs, you almost had like work a little bit to to find where uh, where it would fit in. And was that something where, you know, normally speaking, you guys are are playing the songs live tons and tons, and then you're recording it, or is it, or are there times with it, uh, it, it, it kind of came down to the wire a little more? Uh, well. We did a thing that you're not supposed to, a band isn't supposed to do, but we would release an album. And by the time we toured it, we'd written six, seven, eight new songs that we really dug. So, you know, they were going to go on the next album. But so we're touring, say, Cunning Stunts. Right. And half the show is, you know, sexy P story songs, which nobody's heard. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh,. And so what would happen is, is, you know, we would release an album and I don't know if this is related or not, but uh, we would say Cunning Stunts would come out and they'd say, well, we liked the last album a lot, but uh, we don't, I don't know about this one. And uh, by the time we came through again a year later, that was the album they loved and they, they didn't know about the new one, see. <laughs> right. So it's so when you're when this the stuff that you're playing in front of folks isn't necessarily the thing remotely close to the, the record maybe that they just got. Uh no, we just played whatever got our rocks off and what we thought would drive a, you know, make an audience crazy and uh yeah, it, I I thought it worked out pretty good. So, but then when you're talking about like for compositions, you know, when when you're when you're thinking about what you're going to fit in vocally are you thinking were you thinking about it in terms of what's going to pop live like what's going to work live like what what kind of things are you trying to accomplish i see what you said okay now what would happen like i said before uh the other guys would be doing these really really long jams just over and over we didn't stop we uh, essentially it was a half hour 45 minute of one song and I would try to, uh, I would just wait for a spot to come in and I'd come up with a a melody, but you know, if the melody worked, then later on I would write the lyrics to fit that. But a lot of times we would play the new songs on tour and I hadn't wrote the lyrics yet. So I'm not really saying anything. (laughs) Right. So at at that point, do you... Like hitting the wall, for example, that happened actually in the studio. That's why a lot of it is unintelligible because I'm actually... uh, I wrote the lyrics in on the lyric sheet later. <laughs> what, so then would they, yeah, so would some songs like start to evolve and change based upon, you know, like, oh, actually, you know, this, this, this seems to be that, this seems like that. And the reason why I'm asking is because some folks kind of come from the more like the sound is the most important thing. And for some people, it's like, oh, no, I'm trying to get this particular part of the lyric across in a certain way. And so I'll punctuate it or uh, put the accent on it in such a way that that hits at this time. Uh, well, you have to understand that in the practice space, those guys played so incredibly loud that <laughs> even though I had a mic and a monitor, I never actually heard myself at all in practice. So I would, that's why in the early albums, I'm screaming my head off because that's the only way I could right. hear myself. <laughs> exactly. And I still couldn't hear myself. And so when we'd play a show at a club, they'd be trying to, you got enough of yourself in the monitor? Like, uh, too much, actually. I, uh, <laughs> you could actually I've never hear heard it. myself yeah, sing exactly. before. <laughs> That's, you know, a lot of times I was out of key or whatever because I wasn't used to hearing myself. And, you know, sometimes in the club, a monitor gets dragged away and I couldn't hear myself anyway. But, uh, yeah, I couldn't, but I mostly couldn't hear myself ever. So I had to find a place in my throat that felt like it, the vibration in my throat was matching the vibrations of the notes that were playing at 120 decibels. And, and, Oh, that's how we would, you know, I told you we practiced two, three, four hours, but how we quit was that I would be screaming that whole time. And when I started, I would spit in a can and when blood started showing up, I'd be like, all right, you guys, two more songs. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be you, you, you de- determine the set list based upon when the when the blood would be spit up. <laughs> when my throat is bleeding, yeah, I figured I, that's a good time to stop. Well, two more songs, maybe. I'm having a good time. I'm not going to ruin everybody's fun, but yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, prob- probably wise for health purposes to uh, maybe consider calling it relatively soon thereafter. <clears throat> See, we were all really smart guys, but we were doing a very brutish thing. And, and I don't know how to explain it any better than that. <laughs> well, I think that came across because I think there was a sort of there was such a dark sense of humor to it as well that it was very clear that all you know, all creepiness was intentional like you know all <laughs> all all knuckle dragging was uh done like as as a lampoon or um you know a farce within a farce or something along those lines well uh, lyrically i kind of had a different perspective than some punk rock lyr- lyricists in that I don't think people are bad or wicked or evil. I just think that most people are about 80% nuts and they just keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again and they never fix them. And a lot of my lyrics are more in that vein, that they're doing a stupid thing and they're not learning anything from it. Yeah. Man, it'd be great if you could, uh, if you could make people learn. But that's just not. Yeah, that would be. A, yeah, <laughs> actually, uh, like a lot of noise, a lot of noise bands. Uh, the guys in the bands actually. I I know me and Thor and Kevin. We all went to college to be teachers, and that's actually a very common thing. Yeah. Well, and it's it's something where I, I don't feel like that's uncommon necessarily, but I think there's there's this assumption when people hear a, uh, you know, more brutish noisy kind of thing there's somehow this assumption that there's not any thought behind it or that there's not any intelligence behind it and well that's the layers i told you about though see what we were doing was is you know what a signifier is yes of course that's what my stage presence was all about i wasn't just going up there with the idea of being wacky what i was trying to do in addition to keep people in the moment by bouncing off the walls, I was also sending out signifiers that didn't make any sense with each other, and that would also keep balance, keep people off balance. A lot of times, people will come up before a show like, "Look, I got this wacky thing you could wear on stage." I'm like, "Oh, I'm not trying to be wacky. That is not what I'm doing at all." <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> wacky is about I'm like actually, 180 degrees from what you're actually trying to accomplish. Yeah. <laughs> See, people seem about 80% insane to me. So what I was actually doing is, you know, I was a really quiet, timid kid and teenager. And I decided that I got tired of it and I was going to elbow my way out into the world. So what I was doing on stage to me was I was holding up a mirror. This is what you people look like to me. Mm. (laughs) I tolerate you, but don't get it twisted. This is what, what you're watching is what you look like to me. And I think... Now, there's two ways you can take that. You can join in and and have a good time, or you can be offended by it. How dare you say that? But uh, right, those aren't the people that liked us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, there was a lot of layers on the surface. On the surface, it was brutish. But with Thor, Thor is a really learned guitar player, and he actually notated those parts. Yeah, with his own Thor notation and. Uh, he was talking about stuff like turning blues and jazz inside out or, and, and, you know, so the, there's brains behind it. See, our, you know, things aren't what they appear to be. That was another of our messages. And, yeah. I always, yeah. I always sort of describe his playing style as sort of like non Euclidean geometry, uh, <laughs> blues style, meaning I don't know what that is. Oh, so HP Lovecraft, <laughs> uh, you know, and his, in his many, uh, writings would sometimes talk about um, you know, the old ones and the the insane folks from the the other side and whatnot. And there was a different type of math, and it was a it was geometry, but a different type of geometry. It was non Euclidean. So the idea ah, being that this comes true. from another place. Right. So that, since math is music, then yeah, that makes sense. You can have math jokes, and you can have music jokes. Sure. Yeah. And, 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 and well, we thought fair, of ourselves a, as a blues band, if you want to know the truth of it. <laughs> well, well, sure, yeah, maybe a non-Euclidean geometry blues, blues band. Sure, why not? Because, I mean, it, it's something where, uh, and, and that guy, uh, you know, and Kevin as well, but Thor especially, like, I, I, I'm hard-pressed to think of any guitar player remotely like him. Nah, he was, he actually, see, me and Kevin, 
and the rest of us, we were all in the subculture. Thor was not in that subculture at all. He started out in Nebraska playing Rolling Stones and, and country and, and, you know, it started off for him as something he did when he was working with the children. And, but that chemical reaction happened and he kind of got hooked on it, I think. But, uh, yeah, he wasn't part of the subculture. The first time he saw the butthole, the first time he listened to the butthole surfers on an album, he actually tore the room up. <laughs> and it was my room. <laughs> he tore the he tore the room up because he was excited or because he was uh, no, annoying. No, because he thought it was the worst, <laughs> the worst phoniest thing he had ever heard in his life. And uh, and it's, uh, yeah, he he threw chairs around and everything and stormed off. Wow, I mean, I guess it's nice to get a strong <laughs> reaction, right? I mean, geez. <laughs> so that's if his guitar playing seems like it's not, it, it, it's very unusual in that. In that context, it's because it is. So he never did join the subculture at right. all. Right, he, he was kind of a bit of an outsider, even amongst um, a, a, a group that was marching to its own uh, to its own beat to begin with. Definitely, yeah, it was, it was an odd thing. Yeah. So, so when did you when did you first cross paths with uh, Buzz and the Melvins? With Kevin. Uh, with, uh, uh, with 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 Buzz and because we you mentioned you know him producing the last record and like and one oh. of, the reason why I ask is because uh, from a perspective of creativity and and just from album to album and you know, trying different things and like not uh, not leaving things off the table if they're interesting as much as cows didn't sound like Melvins or vice versa I feel like there was uh, a sort of musical kinship in that same sort of pleasure of finding things out mindset. Uh, yeah, I guess so. But we see, we had known Buzz for many, many years. We played with the Melvins a lot of times. And actually, it's kind of funny. The first time I met Buzz, we were playing with them in Washington, Bellingham, Washington. And we played in a club that in, upstairs, they had a pool table. And we had never met them and they never met us. But I could feel, you know, I, I kind of knew that it was Buzz that was staring at me. So I decided to we hadn't been introduced or anything. So I took two cue balls and I would, I just had these completely random rules and every once in a while I would think a ball and go, damn. And other times I would think a ball and I would go, wow, what a shot. All the, I'm not talking to him though. He's just watching me. Right. And Buzz is a guy who likes to figure out people and what they're about and what they're doing. Yeah. So he actually sat and stared at me for about a half an hour, and finally he came over and he said, I gave up. What the fuck are the rules to this game? <laughs> I said, Buzz, there's no rules. I'm just yanking you. <laughs> That's how we met. <laughs> so it, uh, in the act of him observing what you're doing, it, it was a, the Heisenberg effect because you uh, the, it changed what was the being what watched. Effect? The Heisenberg effect where the act of observing changes something. Uh, another another uh, scientific uh, principle. Uh, uh, I suppose so. I just thought he was, I just could tell he was trying to figure out how my mind works. So I, I just wanted to throw him off the trail a little bit. That's all. <laughs> and there's, uh, I mean, so did you feel with the cows, uh, you know, there was a, 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 a rich scene of different bands at the time. I mean, just from the AMREP community alone, did you feel kinship with, with other bands that were, you know, fellow weirdos, or if not exactly doing what you're doing, you know, bands that uh, you, you felt you had a similar mindset or kinship with um, creatively? Uh, yeah, there was. I mean, I, when I said back in the day that we're going to meet the people in your record collection, I meant people like Gibby and David Yao, yeah. you know, Blag from the Dwarves and, and Jello Biafra and, and uh, Circle Jerks, you know, stuff like that. And, uh, I forget what the question is. <laughs> <laughs> well, who who were the, like who were the bands that uh, when, when you think about a band, and especially a band as idiosyncratic as the Cows, who were your fellow travelers? Uh, right? Who who were the who were the bands that you were like, oh yeah, like it, maybe if not like oh they get us, it's like oh this fits well with these guys. Like we like we like playing. I would with say, these yeah, I would say those bands and see we had an attitude. Like I told you, we marched into Orfolk. 
with the cows and the heroin. Well, the cows, it just came naturally. But when I was trying people out for the heroin shakes, uh, you know, they were a, they would addition. And I would say, listen, if you're just trying to be the best band uh, in this part of town, you're in the wrong band. If you're trying to be the best band in this city, you're in the wrong band. If you're trying to be the best, want to be in the best band in America, you're on the right track. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. If you're not trying to be the best band in the whole world, then you're barking up the wrong tree. And so back then, yeah, there was bands that always blew a place out, and that's we felt that's who we felt the kinship for. But uh, yeah, we at the time we didn't think of ourselves as a Minnesota band per se, because we were aiming higher than that even. Before we were any good at all. <laughs> so, do, do you feel well? It's, and we haven't talked enough about heroin sheiks at all recently. Um, but I'm the, sure. but the it's interesting because a lot of people kind of characterize it as like a little more darker than the cows. Um, I know that you know I'm a big Celine fan. Like Journey to the End of the Night is one of my favorite books. So that, oh yeah, yeah. that was uh, I appreciated I appreciated the references. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, when when you when you've got such a weighty discography behind you. I mean, how much of it for heroin sheiks was like a reaction and how much more, how much of it was a continuation as its own deal? Uh, it was never, uh, it was never a continuation. Uh, just at any given moment, I wrote the best music. I did more writing in, in the heroin sheiks than I did in the cows. I by no means did all of it, but as a lot of cow songs started with the Kevin bass riff, a lot of heroin sheiks songs started out. Uh, uh, my mom gave me a Casio keyboard in about 1996, and I started playing around with it, and I started writing songs on that. And I would teach it to the keyboard player, and, and a lot of heroin sheiks are written like, songs are written like that. Oh, interesting. So you have like like a basic melody and kind of go off of that. Like what what um. Well, and that's interesting because if you think about the fact that the keyboard being a, you know, sort of utilitarian function as a jumping off point, it's got a different, uh, the, the, the range of the keys, like how, how everything's sorted out, it's, it's, you're going to come up with different kind of stuff than you would if it was written on a guitar or bass, I guess is where I'm going with it. Uh, yeah, it could be, but uh, basically it was a really cheap toy Casio that had 99 instruments on it. And so I would just play around with all the different instruments, and uh, if something sounded good, I would record it on a cassette, and so I could remember it. Because songs tend to disappear out of your head like a dream does if you don't get it, get down. it down somehow. So, yeah. Right. So I would do that, and then I would actually learn the song on the cassette and uh, bring it into practice, and it either sucked or it was good. And, but yeah, it, it wasn't self conscious. Is well, I'm going to con continue the cow's legacy or anything like that at all. Uh, it's, I just wrote what I wrote. Yeah, it, so it's interesting that, uh, I mean, did you feel that the living in New York changed the kind of thing that you, that you wrote at all uh, rather than being in Minneapolis? Uh, yeah, you know, you. You go by uh, what surrounds you. For example, the song about you know where I'm walking over a bridge and a, there's a flying cockroach that opens. Sorry, big Meyer. because I had moved to to New York before we made that, and uh, yeah, it just so happened uh, I would walk over the Williamsburg Bridge every day, and I have this weird thing where if I'm crossing a bridge, I, just for a second, I feel like jumping. <laughs> Wow. And I remembered back to when I lived in Texas for a minute that they had flying gigantic cockroaches there and just kind of put the two together. I was like, yeah, so your surroundings affect you. New York's a very different vibe than Minneapolis is. Yeah, and they've, you know, it's, it's something where sometimes you can kind of hear in the music the surroundings. Uh, just basically, you know, like whether it's like mood or whether it informs like the composition or along, or something along those lines. And I wonder sometimes if that's what people talk about when they talk about heroin cheeks being darker. Because it, it's not like the cows were sunshine and roses necessarily, but... Uh... No. <laughs> but I get it. I get, I, I kind of, you know, I get what they're going for. Uh, when they, when they I guess they're... About. Yeah, we do some funny songs, though. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we get kind of a lot of them. 
you know, the way I am is uh, I'll write a d- couple of depressing songs. I'm like, well, I can't have a whole set of depressing songs. And then I write a, a, a really basher fast song. And all right, we got that down. And let's do a little more mid tempo rock. And, you know, I'm trying to, you're thinking kind of that you got to make an album and a live set out of it. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's not really super thought out. So with, with, Heroin Sheiks and writing songs in this, you know, very different way, like writing songs like on the keyboard and, and with different people. Like, were you looking at in terms of, you know, hey, I can, you know, you know, Kevin and Thor are these incredibly iconic players, but they have the things that they do. They have the, the, the ways that they that they do what they're doing. Having different people with different sets of skills, was that something where you were actively thinking about that in terms of... Uh, how you could use that as tools in the toolbox to make something cool, or is that something that just ended up being more? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I, actually, what happened was is that the cows were like our first, basically our first real band that any of us were in. So that's to us was what being in a band was. It was to me anyway. So I moved to New York and I'm auditioning people and we start to jam and that's a little bit much to expect from people that you want to, okay, first of all, you got to try, we're going to be the best band in the world or hit the the bricks. And second of all, I'm used to a practice being, you know, as at least as balls out as as a live show. And uh, that's really, really hard on, on, (laughs) <laughs> people who maybe you want to come to practice and sip a beer and, and yeah. chew the fat. And it's like, no, nah, <laughs> I'm bouncing off the walls. And this is like for real. And we're going to do it for a couple of three, four hours. And we're going to play like we're in Madison Garden. See, <laughs> like it's your last night on earth all the time. Right. And, Bring, bringing that energy that uh, you, you know you brought for the rest of your career. And, and then, then you know, you, if you have, been in the trenches with someone like making records and touring and whatnot. I, I think it's, it's, it's an easy get, but did you find that you, you know, was it intimidating for some of the folks that you played with where they just didn't quite expect, Oh, we're doing, okay. We're doing this. Okay. <laughs> well, the people who made it through the auditions are, were people who could hang with that. Right. I mean, Norman sure, yeah. West were, I mean, he was in the swans. <laughs> John fell. He was, it wasn't his first road. Yeah. Everybody was, you know, raring to go if they passed the, if they passed uh, the audition process, everybody was ready to, to go balls out. But if you're not used to it, it's uh, it's pretty exhausting. And and I just expect that of people. Uh, that's not necessarily a fair thing, but uh, I didn't know any different. That's how I have fun. And, right. Yeah, that, it's, that's... A, it's a selfish thing. And and so you got this. You got the the vision for the band, and then like, what's the the you ended up going out. It wasn't with Butthole Surfers, though. It was with a Gibby Haynes' um, uh, oh god, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, the, the, the Gibby, Gibby Haynes Experience. Or yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, Gibby, a fellow traveler, lover, lover of weird music. It kind of seems like that's a good crowd for that music to be in front of. Uh, did Did you feel like that uh, it got over when you played those shows? Well. The other part about the heroin sheiks, why it was really hard on the other people was the cows, we broke up for a reason. And that was that we went on a tour and it wasn't as full as it was the last time. And the writing was sort of on the wall and just the stress. We'd been together a long time. That's a long time to keep three ultra super alpha males together in one band. And with that, all that chemical reaction going on and, so by the end, it was getting pretty stressful to keep it together, and we were st- starting to suck a little bit of wind on tour. And our our tours were always pretty spotty. You know, we're playing somewhere in Alabama, and there's nobody there. They don't know who the hell we are, and they're not necessarily crazy. We had a lot of nights like that, and uh, but with, by the time the heroin shakes came al- along, we were playing that hard and to have full houses and sometimes less. And, uh, that was, you know, that, that just, that just tears you up. So when you, especially when when you're playing a different era and that people didn't, the kind of experience that 
we were offering audiences wasn't what people wanted anymore. They didn't want to be taken out of themselves like that. They wanted something else, whatever it was. And so I beat my head up against the wall for many years being a very stubborn person. And plus, like playing music, that's that's how I get my rocks off. So it was hard to give up. But uh, yeah, our last tour was just a disaster. And uh, yeah. I mean, do you I'm feel like so any of those elements were in your control, or was it just sort of, you know, the way no, the way the world really. shifted? Yeah, uh, musical taste taste change, and uh, you know, people got used to. There was a lot of bands that were quote unquote crazy frontman bands, and most of them sucked. And so we would play in front of a new audience that's younger and maybe didn't know too much. Maybe they didn't even know who we were and we were older guys. And I get this. This is a crazy frontman band. I'm done. So my whole thing about mixed signifiers and trying to keep them in the moment, I got guys on their cell phone and I can hear them. Not literally, but I know they're talking about, wow, this is a combination between this band and that band. And, and then I would see them nod and sort of wander up to the bar. I, I don't want to play for people like that. Right, like, they, like they, they've made their analysis, as, as we discussed earlier. Yeah. And, <laughs> and they've come to their conclusion. And that's um, I, can, I can't imagine that being something that would, would be no. encouraging. It's like having sex with a dead body. Like, it just wasn't fun anymore. Yeah, that's tough, man. That's that's. <laughs> and I'm not trying to uh, sort of like boohoo it, but uh, you know, there comes a point where all right, it's time to do this. The way I write music and the way we wrote music is very personally expensive. Because when I told you about the three, four hour practices, what we were actually doing was committing the songs to muscle memory. Yeah. So much so that by the time we were in front of an audience, emotionally, there was no place to hide. You're naked out there. And it was designed like that. And that's also very hard for musicians to do. I mean, there's no like looking down and at your pedals and uh, maybe thinking about, you know, tomorrow's gig or uh, no, nah, you had to be the band had to be there in the moment, too. Otherwise, the audience wasn't going to be. Yeah, I mean it's it's That's something a very expensive thing to do emotionally. <laughs> yeah, it's psychically and emotionally expensive uh, to do that, and it's something that it takes a choice. It, it does take a choice, and so then when and when you spoke earlier about you know the quote unquote crazy frontman thing being you know some of a misnomer because you wanted to keep people in the moment and uh, kind of do these <clears throat> things that had larger meaning perhaps or, or didn't like what, how would you approach that? Would you size up the room? Like, are, are, is it something that like evolves in a night by night basis, depending on like, you know, what kind of show it is, what city it is like, we just, you know, well, first of all, like we started having tours toward the end where say we would show up at a club and there'd be people there. And, and I remember somewhere in Texas, somebody said, came up to me and said, hi, hey, Shannon, can't wait for the show. You should have seen the band last night. There was a guy, the lead singer had shaved his head and he had sewn live worms into his head. <laughs> and they were wiggling around. His hair was wigging around. Wow. And, it, and I said, uh, we're not trying to be the weirdest band in the world. That's not what we're doing. But that's what it was turning into, some kind of like weirdo a, a weird off like who can be <laughs> a weird off yeah and then you're not present anymore either why he's the guy i like the guy with the worms at his head better than i like <laughs> well, this yeah. are you going to compete with the guy with hat. worms in his head i mean jesus and the in the in the bra drawn on yeah <laughs> well, been uh, there done that <laughs> so the what was the origin with the uh with, with the marker mustache like where where did that how did that, how did that come to pass? Like what gave you the idea for that? Uh, one day I was wandering around and I I saw a picture of the Mona Lisa that had a Salvador Dali mustache drawn on it. I thought it was pretty cool. And then I looked in the mirror and like yeah, that, <laughs> that looks pretty good. <laughs> well, it's 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 interesting because it's it's almost your iconic look. Like I can't think of anyone well, else that that has has a. a, a Oh, it's been done, but uh, that doesn't matter. I don't care. But the the funny thing was is, you know, I, that maybe have a bra drawn on or 
Lord knows what, drawn on me in magic marker and say we would sleep at somebody's house that had a tour and I would wake up in the morning and there'd be mustaches and hangman and <laughs> bra, like bras stuck to all the sheets and the walls and stuff. <laughs> they had rubbed off me during the night. So. <laughs> Just leave, leaving a little bit of the show behind as a memorial. <laughs> uh yeah. I mean it's it's something where the like what do you think makes for a good front person in a band? Like what 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 uh, manner of things do you like to see for someone that is, as a fan and then take that turn that around to be like what kind of things did you put on or not put on but uh, do <laughs> to make uh, the cows work in the way that you wanted to work? Well, I I never intellectualized it like that, and I wasn't like a really learned person about music. I didn't have a lot of records, and I I, I actually never really seriously thought about being in a band until I actually saw the cows with Norm singing in right in front of me, and I thought literally if they had a monkey jumping around these guys could really take off it would really be awesome i love this music i was like i heard bells like when you hear about uh you know meeting the woman that you're going to spend your life with like yeah. i saw the cows and i heard bells and i i gotta be in this band and uh turned out that norm wasn't really into being a singer and 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 yeah but i never so when you talk about analyzing front men, I mean, uh, never, HR never from the bad it. brains is the best front man ever to me. But I was so ignorant. People would tell me, you're trying to be Iggy Pop. Like, I've never seen Iggy Pop perform. I don't have any. I, I have very, I'm not denying it, but it's not on purpose. I, I had never laid eyes on the guy at that you know, particular juncture. So, no, we just did what we did. And. And, uh, yeah, well, the, that part of it didn't have a whole lot of thought. Like, how are we presenting ourselves? And <laughs> from what angle should we approach this? Like, no. Uh, in, in like, we're scenario, a force of nature. You watch it yeah. or you don't watch it or you walk out. It doesn't matter to us. Uh, if if this whole thing falls in on itself, we'll just go do something else. I never dreamt about being a rock and roll singer at all, ever, <laughs> until I saw them. And then I got in a practice room with them, and I did what came natural. In the scenario you mentioned, I, I think of like a boardroom with like a long oak table, and everybody, you know, sitting around their suits, uh, kind of, <laughs> kind of, with All a right. PowerPoint presentation or something, trying to point out the <laughs> a big fat guy with an accountant sitting next to him, and I'm going to make you guys famous. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You, yeah. You're going to be the monkey. <laughs> Yeah. You're going to be the non-Euclidean geometry uh, guitar player. You're gonna, right. <laughs> you know, everyone's got to right. roll. You're going to be the bass player who wobbles around and slobbers at himself. It'll be great. Actually, the opposite happened. What people don't realize is that in the 90s, when everybody in the world was getting signed, who had played twice on a Wednesday night somewhere, yeah. we never got asked out. We 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 had maybe two or three meetings with major labels and and that was it. And one of them I screwed up really bad because I had been slipped something in my beer. We played the whiskey a go go and I was kind of freaking out. And this really bizarre techno band was playing with really hot topless chick and they had gigantic amps and they were really good. And I was freaking out. At that exact moment, a guy taps me on the shoulder. He says, hi, Shannon, I am from Atlantic Records. Here's my card. And I just kind of stared at him, and I actually ate his card in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> and licked my fingers and turned me around and watched the band. So, yeah, I screwed up our career bad. <laughs> Well, you didn't give the guy a hell of a story, I guess. I mean, that's, that's, not, that's not an average Tuesday night, necessarily. No, nah, it tasted like shit. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So, uh, talk to me a, a, a little bit about... 
<laughs> you know the 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 those early '90s. So since you you did bring it up, like the whole major label thing, right? We talked to talk about that being like, you know, the 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 indie rock gold rush, if we will, where like for, oh for like a brief moment in time they let the weirdos in, right? I mean, did you feel like that was far away from what you guys were doing? Did that feel like that was something that, uh, you know, maybe you envisioned possibly for yourselves? <laughs> well, the thing about 80s bands was is that it was actually just an outgrowth of a subculture. Right. And so we started playing in basements. Oh, and by the way, the first time we played, I was, aren't you nervous? Like, not one bit. I feel no nervousness at all. And I got up there, and the very first note, I fainted. (laughs) Wow, really? I didn't quite go all the way out, but the entire show, I was just right next to fainting. But uh, So, yeah, we came up through basement parties, and then we, you know, Run Westy Run helped us get into the clubs because they didn't want us in there. And to their credit, they said, if you don't take the cows, we're not going to play. And Fred Darden down at First Avenue and Steve McClellan, they liked us. And yeah, they got us, they got us in the clubs, but it was in the, it was just a lark at first, but yeah, it it, kind of gradually took off. And and, uh, And you guys eventually got your star too. The cow, the cows, uh, I mean, I haven't seen in a while, but I I remember seeing, you know, at First Avenue that there was, the cows have their star. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Well, I meet a lot of people now, and you know they don't know where the cows were. I mean, it's thirty years ago, for Christ's sake. Why should they? Yeah. <laughs> and, right, right, right. and you know, uh, so you're a musician, I hear, and I'm like, well, how'd you do? I'm like, well, we do have a star in Bruce Avenue, if that means something. Yeah. But, uh, it, it yeah, does, I don't bring it up or anything. <laughs> right. yeah. you, don't, you don't have a business but card with it that someone can eat it, necessarily. It seems to be important, and I'm glad it's there right above the entry door because that's like one of the top two clubs in America. And uh, yeah, they were good to us always. So yeah, having a star that's dead. Yeah, for a while, I, I didn't really care too much, but yeah, right now, yeah. yeah. It's an honor. It's nice. It's nice to be recognized, and it's nice to be recognized in a way, especially because I mean, you, you guys. It wasn't. It wasn't a commercial sounding band. Like you had your own sound that you defined yourself, which also was inclusive of. You know things that you, like had like musical humor that you would have, like like uh, um, <laughs> was it an unsexy piece story where it was just that that one single little like <laughs> bugle thing, right? Just like mm-hmm. small things where it's like you're like, what? Why did they just do that? Just the one time that's it only shows up for like one second, and hey, just to mess with it. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But it's like for those kinds of folks. It's for the folks that are going to be listening for that kind of thing. It's for the right. kind of, the kind of folks that are going to be listening for, um, uh, uh, you know, that, that single cowbell hit at the end of that one song or, or whatever. Just like that one weird kind of like, what? Did I just hear that right? Like, play that back. Play that back again. And it's it's awesome to have that recognized, even if it's something where okay, yeah, that happened thirty years ago. That I mean, it's for the longest well, time. The way I see it, the way I see it is not to interrupt you, but the way I see it is that if that stuff had not happened, I uh, wouldn't be on the phone with you right now. Talk, exactly. I mean, some you know who who would, give, who who would give a give a shit about what I think about anything? <laughs> who, who cares? But because I did that stuff, you know. Uh, so that's yeah, that's kind of a nice feeling, I guess. Well, because yeah, for for me coming at it from perspective of you know I was a kid coming up in California and, and you know in Oakland and I, from Minneapolis it was like oh yeah Prince, replacements, Husker Du, and Cows like those those were the <laughs> those are the bands that I thought of and I and I never never understood why you know like it wasn't like you guys weren't discussed more in the terms of that pantheon and then like as I got older it's like oh okay like. You know, there's a winner's history of rock and roll thing happening here. Uh, well, the something. thing about that is we, we weren't Minnesota nice. And when we were coming up in the 80s, the, you know, every band was like its own gang. Like if we showed up at a party and another Minneapolis band showed up, like, huh, those motherfuckers are here. Let's get out of here. Or, Let's go fuck with them. Like it, it was... The scene wasn't all pretty and united and feel good. It's like 
yeah, everybody, it was very competitive. That's what made it good is everybody was trying to top everybody else. Yeah. You know, there's limited space and, and yeah, everybody was swinging for the fences. And it wasn't necessarily everyone of these bands sounding the same at all. It was just everyone was, was trying no. to do their best. And I think that makes for a strong community. Uh, that's the thing, though. I, it, it didn't feel like a community. It <laughs> felt more... It was just a subculture. We're the people who hang out at parties. We're the people who go out at shows. Black Flag was good last night. Oh, yeah, I think we can do that. Shit, we can get up there. <laughs> that's, that's how people started band. Oh, well, fuck, we're, we, I can do that. And some people were good at it. Most people weren't good at it. And, and you know, it's it, it seen through nostalgia now, but he wasn't feel good. And, and it was during a Reagan era and everything sucked. Yeah. That's why everybody was so angry. <laughs> right. <exactly. laughs> we weren't all, we weren't all happy and stuff. Yeah. We we're rebelling against that. So getting back to your early question about the major labels, it was kind of a matter of everybody who came, nobody who came up through that subculture was thinking about being a successful rock star. In fact, people were sort of against that sort of a thing. And then Nirvana hit, and all of a sudden there's a lot of guys out there offering big bucks. And then, it, you know, it, it, it turned into, it, it was a pain in the ass for three or four years. Every interviewer was talking about, you get assigned. You're going to sign? What do you think about people signing? What do you think about this? And, you know, I had a story. You know, I know a prominent musician in Minneapolis. And this, like, why did you sign to a major? You know, it's kind of, you know, people are talking about it. And that person said, uh, well, my mother has cancer and I need to come up with some money. Wow. And, and uh, yeah, you, you never know why anybody signs to a major label, right, and right. it's none of your business anyway. And, but it was a huge deal. You, you're against the revolution, but frankly, like I said, nobody was asking us anyway, so it was easy for us to <laughs> kind of be the point man on the anti-corporate revolution or whatever it was. Well, yeah, and like on that same line, you know, there's that Minutemen that Minutemen song that's used in uh, Jackass. Right. And a right. bunch of people got all upset about it. And then it's like, yeah, well, did you know that, you know, Watt allowed that to be used because uh, D Boom's dad needed like money for like medical bills? And everyone's kind of like, oh, man, there you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, maybe you know, maybe I shouldn't so, be so judgy. <laughs> yeah. Don't be so quick to, you know, the thing about any level of success is that even your fans are waiting for you to look bad. <laughs> right. Yeah. Everybody wants to be at, you know, everybody likes to be at the show or, or there's five people there and you're the first people to see him. But also people kind of want to be at the show where you, you lost a step and they're kind of waiting for it. <laughs> Sitting there with their and, notebook. <laughs> well, no, it's like, yeah, I went to see, you know, the Jesus lizard and it wasn't packed. And I, I saw that coming. Yeah, I saw that coming. And, yeah, once that whole thing gets punctured, you you kind of screwed, and yeah, people are waiting for it. it, it I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing. It's no, just, just kind of the way people are. Yeah, that's why gossip shows thrive because everybody's waiting for a big star to fuck up, and they can point and say, "Ha, ah, I knew that person was an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it all." Uh, yeah, here, what here, an ego. Here's Thinking your trophy. They could be a big star. <laughs> yeah. yeah, here's, here's, here's Thank your. Thank you better than me. Ha. Ah. Here, here's your medal. Congratulations. <laughs> right. Now take it to the gutter with you where you belong. <laughs> <laughs> there's actually people, see, you know, uh, there's people that actually I can tell when they meet me, like I don't, I don't look all haggard and all of that stuff. And there's people that are disappointed by that, actually. <laughs> I can tell. That's fucked up. <laughs> you know, I was the guy who was supposed to die, you know, go flaming out an OD or something, and I never did. And yeah, some people are mad about that. Actually, believe it or not. <laughs> wow, that's that's <laughs> a something about, our, uh, out there. about the the kind of myth making that, uh, that 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 folks do, I guess. But then, it, it is interesting that only certain stories ever seem to get told, right? Like, you know, you have your behind the music where it's like, okay, then they go into rehab, and then the, here's the here's the comeback, and such and such. You know, just these familiar uh, tropes and and uh, narrative 
functions that, that that people are used to, and they kind of impose that frame upon actual musicians and and bands sometimes. Yeah, so like the thing about that is is that and a lot of people listening are going to think this is a preposterous statement, and probably everybody knows me, but I actually don't have I have sort of a mental thing going on, and always I don't have an ego. Like other people think of it. Now, I'm egocentric, but that's different. And an egomaniac is somebody who thinks they're better than other people. An egocentric person is the person who says, there are other people. Yeah. <laughs> Thus, I can blab on and on about myself, but it's like, wow, well, I'm, I'm a pretty cool guy. No, that's not happening. Well, yeah, and, and, there's, and there's different ways for different personality types to manifest. And I, I think people tend to be most confused by folks that are comfortable in themselves. Uh, right. Well, this is, see, when we did Sorry and Pig Minor, we knew it was going to be our last one. It's just the way the stars were lining up. It was sort of like, and this is going to sound egomaniac, but it was kind of our Zen arcade. Sure. Yeah. Who's going to do is never, who's going to do after that to me. And uh, we knew we were, this is going to be it. So there's a song called Death in the Tall Weeds. Now, on one level, it's a song about a couple who did something or another wrong, and it's not turning out well. And you could also take it, though, is that's a song about the cows and their fans. And Yeah, the first uh, the first line is, I, I do what I do. I can't explain it. You did it, too. You helped me make it. Yeah. So whip it out. We all go sometime. Yeah, <laughs> it was like that. Yeah, and that and that's an interesting record that I actually think that record's aged fairly well. Also, um, you know, you know, I do yeah, fairly well. It's it's something that's where that's yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's it it also it has the thing that a lot of records around that era had too, where there's like yeah, the the hidden track, like the, the like the dub. <laughs> The, the the dub sounding thing and the what what was the story behind that like the one at the oh, end of the same is, we're just screwing around in the studio and a mic got left on that's all and Thor started playing a song on the guitar I think that's what you're talking about yeah it, well it's funny because it's just you know you mentioned that being kind of like knowing that that was kind of going to be the end Right, and but it it, it ends on a, done, yeah. It, it kind of ends on it, yeah, exactly. But it kind of ends. And on the a, last song on the album was "Say Uncle." Say which, Uncle, exactly. Was, which was what we were doing. It's actually a song about me. Give it up. Give up. It's done. Say Uncle. No. But but it's also That's kind of like with 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 this the secret stuff at the end. It's sort of like oh, but even to the end, like they're kind of like having a laugh on it. Like they're kind of like you know, uh, doing just. <laughs> Here's some. Here's some. Oh, Thor's little guitar part in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was great. <laughs> like, like it's sort of like, yeah. But even then, you know, we're going to be aware enough to be like, no, this is this is what we are. And it's, I don't know, it's something I'm not sure if I appreciated it when it came out necessarily, but I've, uh, you know, listening back to now, I was like, I think that's a really cool way to to end to end that last record. And it's, it's very. It was on purpose that way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was on purpose. <laughs> Uh, it's funny because people think we're these Neanderthals. So actually, when we played our last show in the main room, uh, people sort of, we didn't announce it was our last show, but people kind of knew. And we ended it with Memorial. Yeah. And the review of the show in the city pages was, it was kind of neat that they ended with Memorial. It's kind of, of course, the cows aren't smart enough to have done it on purpose, but it was a pretty neat idea. <laughs> yeah. It actually it actually said that in the write-up. <laughs> yeah. Yes, wow. it did. Wow. Wow. Oh, that's rough. That's <laughs> that's a that's uh, a thanks we a pa- thanks a pants load, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, it was funny. <laughs> sure. Do you feel that? I mean, it's you know, somewhat anachronistic because it was a VHS thing. But the um, that concert video, the the Nuggets and Doozies. Do you feel like that's a good representation uh-huh. of what you guys were doing at that time? Uh, yeah, except, yeah, there's some scenes in there, I think, for, I haven't watched it in maybe 10 or 15 years, but where I'm in the orange pajamas and yeah. we're playing in a little club in Philadelphia. I was actually almost dead of probably standing pneumonia when we did that. That's 
kind of what I remember about it. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, was so. laying backstage and I couldn't move. And then I was, well, time to play. And yeah, that, that shit. So yeah, I was really sick when that was recorded. But yeah, I, yeah, it's a pretty good uh, representation. Well, and, and and I like that it had the you know it had the music videos kind of interspersed in with the live footage too, so you get a little bit of like you know the uh, the, the artsy presented side through through that yeah. also. Yeah, I think Kevin stole that title from a book that Ann Landers put out, Nuggets and Doozies. <laughs> Ann Landers. <Wow. laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, we had something else we put out called Painful Nyuk Nyuks that was. Uh, Somebody had written into Dear Abby talking about, well, I don't know what to do about Junior. He keeps pinning his sister and inflicting painful nyuk nyuks. <laughs> <laughs> See, but that's one thing that's so great about what you guys' stuff was, is that it, that there's, you know, there, there's like a, 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 a funny little uh, soliloquy or, uh, you know, a mini story behind like so much of, uh, of what you guys oh. did. Yeah, get this, like the, the album Orphan's Tragedy, that came, we were all sitting in the van on tour, and I was reading the paper, and there was a little headline on page 27D, the headline was, An Orphan's Tragedy. <laughs> so what happened was, is that this kid's parents both died of a heart attack or a car accident or something on the same day. And when the kid went out to the funeral, went out to the gravesite, he was struck by lightning and killed. <laughs> An wow. orphan tragedy. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that, that, and that's the one that has that Supremes cover on it too, right? If I if I remember correctly, is like a kid, there's like kids on it, like young babies or something like that. Uh, yeah, it looked like that. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's, God, man, truth can sometimes can be stranger than fiction, you know. Yes, an orphan's tragedy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the second... it's a good summation of our career. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was the the second time you work with Ian Burgess. Is that is that right? Sexy Peace Story was the first, and uh, Orphan's Tragedy was the second. Am I, is my timeline right there? Does that sound remotely? Uh, I think we did cutting sense with him too, if I recall. Of course, yeah. The... Oh, that was funny when we met him. <laughs> So, you know, big muckety muck, he's being flown in from England to produce your record. We're going to, you know, I'm going to have him meet you guys at the CC Club and I want you to behave. So he was supposed to show up at eight o'clock. So at five minutes to eight, I went to the jukebox and I played, uh, I was like, you make me weep. I want to die. Love and touch and squeeze it. Oh. I put it on the juke. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I put it on the jukebox like 15 times and, uh, he comes in and sits down, and that song plays over and over and over. And finally, he couldn't come. Like, what is this? Like, whoa. what's going on? And, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, we did that. Just <laughs> <laughs> a mess with. <laughs> how was it? How many was it? How many times did it play through before he noticed or said something? Oh, like a like maybe six or seven, eight. <laughs> I mean, it played over and over. Nobody, you know, it was pretty empty in there. Nobody put anything else on. So. <laughs> That's a lot of love and touching and squeezing. And he said, you know what? I like you guys. I'm going to do it. Yeah, That was the meeting to, if he was going to do it. Or that, not. Was the me- <laughs> that, that actually yeah. makes it better. That, that, was the, that was the production meeting. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, he was going to meet us and then decide if he was going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know he can hang if, if you're pulling, you know. Yeah, he was a lot of fun. Yeah, we did one, uh, I think. We did one of those. He lived in France, and we went to his little chalet out in the countryside near the ocean somewhere. It was really cool. It was a little farm like you see in World War I movies. Like, yeah, it was very, very picturesque. And a cow pasture out back, and he had about 15 cases of apple wine of some sort, and that was the only oh, wow. thing to drink. And so I think we drank all of them. <laughs> I can't put all 15 cases of it, huh? <laughs> yeah, we were out there for a week. So. Uh, and that's, uh, I, I really, the album cover on that, which it's like the um, like the fonts are uh, kind of like almost like the Blue Note stuff, right? Like I, I thought Hell, that was like yeah. a really great kind of, especially considering what other albums look like at that time. Like it was something where it was like, oh, because I, you know, I'm going to out myself here. I worked at a record store. 
So, uh-huh. <laughs> so it's like around that time. Let's go and say okay. it, it looked very right. different than most of the records coming out of that. In a way that's like, oh, of course the cow was like put out a record that looks like you know it it should be like uh, a John Coltrane collaboration or something along those lanes. That's awesome. So, well, that was all Tom Hazelmeyer's idea. But uh, a couple of things about that that album cover was uh, at, that was all the cover was Hazelmeyer's idea. But at the time, I had these fake uppers, dentures, that somebody in Kevin's family had died in a cabin out in the woods somewhere. And when they went through it, for some reason, somebody picked up those dentures and gave them to Kevin. And I started wearing them at shows. And the guy's name was Gordy. And so that's what I named the teeth. Like, uh, wait a bit. So that was my contribution as I put Gordy in the glass of water there. Yeah, which is which is foregrounded. So it's something where, where, where if you just kind of – if you're not – if you're looking at it and you're not paying that close attention, like you can kind of think you know what the album cover is, then you'll look a little closer and be like, wait, are those – and then you're like, those are dentures? <laughs> like what? what is that? <laughs> but, oh, the other part of that was is that, you know, the lyrics are on the back – but at the end, it's signed by Morgan Mundane, who was a really old guy who had a show on uh, WCCO radio for like 40 years. <laughs> it, Steve Cannon was the guy, and he did a voice of a guy who talks like Columbo, and that was Morgan Mundane. There. And that's who signed it. And underneath that, Sexy P Story was, turned out to be our next album, but we had, we put it on the back of that album because we noticed out on tour that we were getting reviews that didn't seem like the reviewer ever listened to the record. Mm. So we put Sexy P Story on the back of the preceding record so we could tell when we read our reviews who actually listened to the album or not. And, uh, <laughs> a couple of people actually fell for it. They a guy the in New York, <laughs> the guy the guy in the New York press said, uh, yeah, the cows have a new release, but they're so, in, they're so out of ideas that they're re-releasing old songs. That's what Sex and Peace <laughs> there is. They got busted. That's why we did that. Yeah. Uh, that's great. <laughs> and that's... Uh... Uh, that's the one that, uh, that has uh, 39 lashes on it, right? That's the um, yes. the, the Jesus, Christ, uh, Jesus so. Christ Superstar, right? That's Yes. Oh, that was a cover we did. <laughs> the story behind that is, is that, okay, we had decided that all the hard guy, all the bad, bad boy Minneapolis bands eventually became kind of you know, they wanted to be more mature and have their ideas respected by smart people and all that bull. So we sort of went the other way with it. Right. <laughs> and so we never did benefits because we always, you know, in wrestling, you have the face, the good guy, and you have the heel, the bad guy. Mm-hmm. We decided that we were never going to be anything but a heel, no matter how much people liked us. We were never going to do anything good, see. But we got asked to do a take back the night benefit in the main room. So we were kind of playing around with that in practice. So when it came that night, take back the night, I went out and I drew on my stomach a picture of a uterus with a fetus behind bars. (laughs) And for the 39 lashes, we had a dominatrix in full costume actually whip me 39 times during the song. <laughs> now that is commitment to the bit. I like it. <laughs> yes. So, but the, you know, mentioning like being the heel, right? Like, so was that something where, yeah. did you just think that like, okay, this is going to be more fun? Like in, in the way that the, um, like actors often say they have a better time playing villains. Like, the villain is the better role to play. I guess. That maybe. It wasn't quite that thought out. It's just like, this is punk rock. We're the, we're, we're the bad guys. <laughs> but it's funny. We toured with Primus, and uh, we were about halfway through the tour playing a gigantic ballroom somewhere, and I was, I was talking to Wes, 
And he said, so, you know, is it hard for you, like, opening us for every night and they hit your guts and throw things at you? I said, nah, here's the thing, Les. It's that the way I think of it is is that we're the heels and you're the face. So it's our job. They're going to hate us anyway. Yeah, yeah. So our Let's job is it. to be <laughs> such heels that by the time you guys come on, they'll just break out and love you. So, uh, yeah, that's that's what we're up to. So uh, he says, you know, that's that's pretty interesting take on things. And uh, so about a half an hour later, they they had a big screen there, like at First Avenue, and all of a sudden they were flashing like up. They had the the local news on live, mm-hmm. and they were interviewing they were interviewing Les. <laughs> they said, "How's the tour going?" I understand you're playing with a band called the Cows. What's that like? I hear they're pretty crazy. And he said, well, here's the thing. Um, what they're, I feel like what they're doing is they're playing the heels and I'm more <laughs> unkind of the face. Just and repeating back the conversation that you just had. His 30-foot tall head is right in front of me and we didn't know it was coming. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm 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 sure it sounded good no matter who was saying it, but uh, that, that that is an interesting uh, <laughs> modus operandi because it definitely. Well, what we were doing was, you know, they were booing us anyway. So I would come out and right away, you know, we play one song and boo, and I said, you know what, Primus isn't here yet. They're running a little late. So here's the deal: every time you boo us, we're adding a set to our song. <laughs> and somebody out there, boo, and I say, that's one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> boo, that's two. <laughs> you want to keep going? And then I had a slingshot in my back pocket after a while. I kept it in my back pocket like Bart Simpson. So if anybody threw at it, anything at us and I caught him, I would return the fire. I had a pocket full of quarters. <laughs> that's that's a good way of upping the stakes, you know? <laughs> yes. And boy, were they terrified. <laughs> <laughs> well, but then a situation like that where one one would hope that for a band like Primus that is relatively idiosyncratic that people would, they would have an open-minded audience. That isn't always the case, though. Like, it's something where sometimes you're just in the way of someone's favorite band, right? <laughs> if Well, if you, go to a, if you go to a big show to see your band and you never even heard of the opening band, that's just what people do. I mean, Prince opened for the Rolling Stones and he got booed off the stage. I think Jimi Hendrix got booed off the stage when he toured with the monkeys. You know, that's just how it goes. <laughs> right. So, so uh, yeah, that was, that was okay. But uh, then we toured with Tool once and we were getting booed and people were throwing nasty stuff at us. And so singer from Tool is like, well, uh, I'm going to go out in front of the audience and I'm going to put a stop to this. I, I didn't, you know, being a heel, I didn't like that idea. He did it a couple times, and it didn't really help. And I said, uh, you know, uh, that's a nice thing to do, but uh, no, it, it's, it's, yeah, <laughs> don't do that. Let them hate us. If they want to hate us, they're gonna, they're gonna hate us. Like it's, it goes with the territory. No big deal. We can take it. Oh, back to Primus. See what I was doing. Just uh, we would start with shit beard every night. Right. So it begins with this long dirge, <laughs> and everywhere we were going in these ballrooms had these stacks of speakers. And one particular, uh, I, I would climb onto the top of the speakers, however tall they were, and I would stand on my head, and I would drop down, and the, the song would kick in. Well, one night, it might have even been the same night he was on TV. It was a really tall set of speakers, and like, wow, that's like 50 feet up there. And the top one is pretty little. It's like a speaker that you have at your house. I'm like, well, I got to do it. Yeah. So I, I climbed the stack and the down, down, and I got to the top. And when I got all the way up there, I noticed that the top speaker wasn't set down on the other speakers. It was hanging by 30 foot chains from the ceiling. <laughs> And it was only, it was only about one, two feet by two feet, and I did it. <laughs> I stood on my head up there, and like, well, I'm doing it, and I'm drunk. Now I got to get down. Yeah, and I'm- it was pretty tippy, as you can imagine. And and I did it anyway, and I climbed back down, and the song ended, and 
boo. <laughs> Nobody even noticed. I mean, it gave a shit. And plus, it didn't even occur to me until maybe 20 years later that, you know, when I did that shit, it must have been pretty rough on it. I mean, I could have fallen. Yeah, that, that, that could have ended very That must have been pretty hard on the cows. <laughs> <laughs> what an asshole. Well, yeah, so that's that's what I was, was driving at. Is was when you have things like that going through your head, is it is there ever any, any thought towards this could go sideways? This could be like, you know, maybe like, you know, this would be something that maybe I should not do at this moment in time. No, well, you know, when you think of something like, when you start thinking like that, you know what happens? Something goes sideways. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's like the, uh, uh, just, you know, so, someone screams out, don't think of an elephant, right? <laughs> right. Something like that. Yeah. You, no, you, you can't be afraid or, you know, I had people try to murder me on stage and, and I didn't, really think of it too much at the time but yeah i mean i had people pull guns and throw bricks at my head <laughs> i mean it's just it's it's a it's a it's a lot to handle I mean, is it something where does i mean if your life's in danger does it does it take you out of the moment at all or is it something where it just it's that's just that's entertainment no actually actually i'm thinking this guy is taking the audience out of the moment i gotta do something about it so usually if somebody was fucking with me too much, you know, the first time I'd say, off mic, don't do that. And the second time I would say, if you do that again, I'm going to hurt you really bad. Off mic. The third time they did it, if they did it a third time, I hurt them pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> you know, I wore steel toe boots back then. Yeah, I was, was, was going to say, it's, they're, they're, they're crossing the line anyway. You know, even for the first time, but if you already are worrying them twice, I guess, you know. It's... Off mic, yes. I thought that was pretty generous of you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, more Another than time we were do. playing in Texas, uh, there was an enormous, probably six foot four, 300 pound, enormous biker standing next to the stage heckling us as we we're playing. And I'm like, wow, this guy is really distracting the audience a lot. I can't let this keep going. What am I going to do? as I'm singing the song and jumping around. And what I decided to do is in the middle of a song, by surprise, I I jumped over and I kissed him on the mouth. <laughs> you know, I hugged him and kissed him right on the mouth. And then I jumped back and he just started laughing and guffawing. Yeah. And, uh, and it worked out, it, you know, he didn't kill me or try, but after the show, he came backstage with, and he said, he had a woman with him, and you know that was a really good show. I didn't think I was going to like it, but that was pretty awesome. How would you like to spend some time with my old lady? And she's smiling and in <laughs> her head. And, well, no, thank you, Mister Big Huge Biker. <laughs> <laughs> it's brotherly. But yeah. No thanks. I got my own thing going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not necessarily looking oh, to yeah, become yeah, Eskimo right. brothers at that moment in time. Yeah. <laughs> or, Oh yeah, I understand. Okay, <laughs> no offense, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we talked about, uh, earlier about it, but when you're you know, playing various, when you were playing various places, is it something where, when you're presenting the live show, are you taking in everything that's like a part of the stage? You know, whether just you know, literally or. The stage. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah, like you started asking me about that before, and what I would do is, we would load in, and most people went off and had lunch or met with old friends in town or whatever. But I stayed in the club, and eventually the opening bands would do their sound check, and I stayed there the entire time, taking in the energy in the club. And I would watch all the opening bands and take in that vibe and the, the vibe of the audience. And, you know, if they seem like a threat to maybe a, our show by doing something crazy, I might change the set list. You know, if they played really dark, scary stuff, I might start off with the really fast stuff. Yeah. Whatever they did, if they were a threat to us, I, whatever we did first would cleanse the palate. So, yeah, we cheated a little bit, but. But yeah, I like to always stay in the club and take in the vibe and know exactly what it is. Yeah, and yeah, it's different every night. And that way, you can provide a contrast 
and, and yeah, and or it. if the audience, you know, if, if you know, a lot of times the opening bands weren't anything special, and but then I take in that energy, or some 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 crowds are just loaded for bears, and, and sometimes you don't you get a don't give a shit crowd, and you got to take that in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Whatever nice. keeps them in the moment. Yeah. Sometimes we play a club and it'd be all like toothless crackers sitting at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> They'd watch our sound check. Sometimes they liked it. Sometimes they didn't. But, yeah. And you know, the sound man just sort of twiddles a couple of knobs and gets in his car and drives away. Yeah, <laughs> Good on you. Hope you have a great show. <laughs> yeah, that's... Right. Or, uh, hey, you seem like you're kind of crazy. <laughs> the monitor? You're kind of uh, crazy. I'm going to give you the shittiest mic we have in case <laughs> you seem like you might be breaking stuff. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, yeah. I don't want to put any of the equipment at risk. <laughs> right. Or G.G. Allen played here a few nights ago. Here, he used this mic. I, yeah, I know you don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. I know what he does with mics. <laughs> so, can you talk about? And this is uh, the cows are an interesting example of, you know, the, the lineup being mostly static, but having you know, you, you guys had different drummers over the years, and everybody yeah. dr- drummers change a band, you know, based on how they play uh, to a certain degree. Like, I mean, for instance, Freddie, I think, kind of had more of a jazzy sort of style, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was he was a kid genius, you know. So, what did you feel? Yeah, what, what did you feel like each of yeah. the drummers brought to what the what, what the band did? Like, what what did they bring to it? Well, the first drummer, Sandra Sandris, was Kevin's brother, and he was there from the beginning when they played at the home, and uh, and him and Kevin were close brothers, and so. It, it, it was like playing with family. Yeah. And then Sandris had he moved, he ended up moving back to Lincoln. He got married and wanted to get a house and have kids and stuff. And he wasn't into the whole rock. He wasn't a punk rocker and uh, yeah. But Sandris, we're gonna be famous. Like yeah, but I, I don't care about that stuff. So <laughs> he <a> left. <laughs> and so we went up to the practice space and we didn't know how to get another drummer. And so we would just go to practice and and it, it actually degenerated to the point where I had a, like a, a, a snare drum and some cracked sticks. And so those guys are tearing it up and I'm keeping the time on the snare drum. <laughs> and it went that way for a little while, but people, there was maybe 10 other bands practicing in that space and well, we had nailed a mummified dead mouse to our door and made, you know, <laughs> horrific. They, you know, they were kind of afraid of us. <laughs> and, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, anyway, one day there was, a, you know, between songs, we were getting kind of bummed out, not having a drummer, and knock, knock, knock. It was Tony Oliveri. said, uh, you guys seem like you might need a drummer. And said, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we do. You interested? And, and, Said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Which it took balls. So he had enough balls to step up to that, and and he he got in the band. Yep. Yeah, and that's. But, a, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, please. Oh, but uh, what were you gonna say? Oh, I was just gonna say, and and it's sort of, I, I think his style, uh, like it's hard to imagine those songs uh, from that era kind of being played by anyone else. Like his style, like fit to a T, like what you guys were, were doing then. Uh, but it's interesting uh, because it's 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 sort of <laughs> again just you had you had drummers with different styles uh, over the years and like it, while the band itself you know maintains certain aspects of it there was it, it sort of matched the evolution of of the music and where you guys decided to go with it. Yeah, it kind of evolved together. I mean, uh, the drummer is holding it down, so uh, yeah, it affects it affects what we play and what we don't play. Different drummers have different things that they're good at, and, and yeah, so yeah, it changes. But when Freddie Votel, thing about Freddie Votel is he came up with a band called TVBC, and they were like a really, really good band. The guitar player Paul Metzger, he played sitar that he had learned in India, and they played like the Walker Art Center, and 
Freddie was just a teenager <clears throat> because his, his older brother had brought a drum kit. And he said, hey, little Freddie, look, I got a drum kit. Yeah. I'm going to join a rock band and I'm going to get a lot of girls. And then, uh, hey, Freddie, you want to try playing? And Freddie just sat down and he was magnificent. He was so good that his parents paid for lessons from somebody from the Minnesota Orchestra. Wow. And that guy came in and he said, this kid doesn't need lessons. He was that good. Yeah. And so he had, like, his history was he was in a super popular band, TVBC, who was very intellectual, let's say. So then they kind of grew apart and and we needed a drummer. And he he called us, actually. <laughs> really? I just and, wanted to see if it was, hey, you guys still looking for a drummer? Yes, but he was known for TVBC, and so the City Pages was just aghast. Like, say it isn't so. Freddie Votel joins these these drooling Neanderthals. <laughs> say it's not true. What's going on? Yeah, we always thought he had such a bright future, and he's hung up with these hooligans. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he's falling in with a bad crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Little Freddie. <laughs> Uh, so then when, uh, yeah, so, so with, with that era of, of cows, like at some point, is it fair to say that Thor, you could kind of see it coming that Thor kind of was getting, getting ready to peace out near the end, like that he was, um, kind of over it or just wanting to do something different. Like how, how did that manifest? Well, uh, they don't talk about it, but see, a band breaking up is a lot like a divorce. And like, yeah. But yeah, the, the story was like the last couple of years, we were just really kind of not getting along anymore. I mean, like I said, keeping three alpha males who are extremely different people together that long. I mean, it was. You know, we were addicted to the chemical reaction that happened when we were playing, but now the audience were, you know, because of the Nirvana thing, the audiences were dumbing down, and there's frat boys showing up, and, and, uh, and you know, some of the shows were getting smaller, and it was, it was just, you know, we were getting older. See, when you're younger, among guys anyway, it's kind of like, at first you're in a movie together, but... As men age, each one like okay, it turns into your own movie. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So Kevin was having his movie, and I'm having mine, and Thor's having his, and you know, his movie goes that way, and mine goes that way, and Kevin's goes that way, and then we got to write the songs and tour together. Chemical reactions there. That's not going anywhere. But uh, yeah, we gotta we gotta live together. In fact, I told our booker, you know, we would tour for 30 days at a time and then take two months off at least. And he said, uh, I think you guys should tour more while you're hot. And I said, uh, Peter, if we tour more than we are, we won't get along and break up. And you, nobody, there, there won't be a cause anymore. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, one, it's good to, it's good to know your one. limits that way, right? It's good to, it's if you're talking about, you know, trading – long-term longer-term sustainability for like short-term gains you know it's like okay yeah you did 60 uh, days great but everybody's pissed at each other and now nobody wants to do the band anymore. oh we we just <laughs> no we would have we would have collapsed in upon ourselves and yeah. like somebody would have said the wrong somebody would have quit and yeah it was just it was you know a lot of bands like us if you delve into the band politics it gets really complicated and ugly and uh yeah, that happens to a lot of bands, and we were together a long time. So, and by that time, we're you know getting in our upper thirties and early forties, and yeah, it was it was and the subculture was gone, and, and uh, yeah, it was just time. So, yeah, you know, it is what it is. It's yeah, I mean, it's you know sometimes it's just time, right? That's that's. Well, uh, I, I I think of it this way: is that you know, we were early punk rock was kind of a frontier and it wasn't, it was sparsely populated and kind of anything goes, but on the frontier, eventually there's more houses and then there's a town and 
and, and things spring up and, and the people who are the frontier people, they go somewhere else. Now that's not a bad thing because inside of those houses, there's doctors and lawyers and people having families. It, it, it's just different. Yeah. Other things it's behind just the music. It's just different. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So the frontier went away and what well, so there's really kind of no place for us anymore. Yeah. It happens. Can you can you tell me briefly about the the Bash Fifteen with the cows thing? We got together with Paul. What's that? The 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 Grumpies, the Bash Fifteen, the the cows with the <laughs> <clears throat> with a Z with Paul Sanders. Right. Well. Well, we sort of had an unspoken deal in the cows that without. Me and, you know, we could change drummers, and that was really hard, and it sucked, but that was possible. But without me, Kevin, and Thor, it's not the cows. So I I couldn't call it the cows with an S. I call it cows with a Z. Now, one day I was bartending at Grumpy's, and Paul Erickson and Paul Sanders from Hammerhead came in, and they sat out on the back patio. And a little ding went off in my head. And so I went back there and I said, you guys, now Bash 15 is coming up and I, I would like to do a cows show. However, here's what's going to happen. Now, I know that Freddy Votel has a practice space somewhere and I haven't called him yet, but here's the deal. Now, Paul Erickson, you would have to learn all of Kevin's parts, but you can't play during the show. Because Kevin's going to fly out two days before the show or something. Oh, gotcha. And... So Paul would be like the stand-in. He would be the stand-in to... All right. Okay, gotcha. Right, right. Okay. And Paul Sanders, you are going to be able to play the live show, but who in the hell knows what the fuck Thor is playing? <laughs> right. You're going to have to figure that out. Non-Euclidean and... geometry guitar, as we established earlier. And everybody's going to be saying, where the hell's Thor? What's this guy doing up here? And some people aren't going to like that. But... Much to my astonishment, they were both instantly down with it, and uh, and it was off to the races. Yeah, that I really mean, surprised me. But that the chances of that ever happening again are almost zero. Pretty so well. people are like, why don't you guys do it again? It's like that was like making peace in the Middle East right there. <laughs> it was a miracle, a miracle that it ain't gonna happen again. Yeah. I mean, it's it's cool it's cool that it happened at all, and it, it kind of is one of those things that I think those um, Grumpy's bashes are kind of unique events for a lot of reasons. But the fact that like cool stuff like that can can happen kind of makes that all the more special. Yeah, that was great. And you know, as far as the cows reforming and do it well, first of all, when we did that, we put the word out that you know maybe we can keep this together for a week or two, and is anybody else interested? And, Nobody seemed too interested, so that never Aww. happened. <laughs> yeah, so yeah I wasn't expecting. Yeah, I wasn't expecting it. Uh, it. It was what it was. It, it was possible, so I put out some feelers, and it didn't come through. You know, how much are you willing to pay? I'm up. I'm willing to pay up to twenty dollars. <laughs> yeah. uh, Nine hundred dollars. Like, no, that ain't gonna do it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not, but the other part of it was is just the you know like I told you when we would go out on tour we were already playing half new songs right. even then so the whole idea of you know none of us are nostalgic people so the whole idea of us getting in a practice space for a month to play old songs uh, it's really not our character yeah it doesn't really seem like it'd be the exact uh, mo <laughs> Right. Of you guys as and, people or uh, as, a, as a band, that that would be how you would do it. It, it. it could be that the chemical reaction would take place again, and then that would almost be worse. We might fall in love with it all over again and go out and suck wind for five years. Who knows? <laughs> but, yeah. Well, they, they should have stayed retired like that. So, but Dora wasn't interested anyway, so it never came up. Do you think there's... Uh, do you think there's ever any chance that we might see like a reissue of a, of some of the stuff that's out of print or anything? They've the been, uh, yeah. Tom's been reissuing them over the last several years. 
most of them have come out on reissue already. Yeah, the the more limited edition, kind of the lino cut stuff. Um, really cool. Right. But I, I guess what I'm driving as more of like a, uh, you know, in case you missed it, sort of like box set kind of a <laughs> kind of situation. Oh. You know what I mean? Like a larger release. Uh, I don't know. I never really thought about it before, but I don't. I, I don't think there's a huge audience out there for it. To be honest with you, we're, we're pretty obscure, and it was a long time ago. But uh, well, I wouldn't be the person to judge that, really. Yeah, there's there's a lot of folks that weren't around then that have found the band and and get a lot out of it. Uh, I'll, I'll say that much. Is it is enough for it to be sustainable or to warrant some big money a, enterprise? I don't know, but. <laughs> You know, it is it's, worth it. It's all up on the internet anyway. <laughs> that is true. Yes, it is all on the internet. Yeah. Uh, Shannon, this has been great, man. Thanks so much for doing this. This, oh. is, uh, this has been a blast. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, was, I had a good time. Thank you. Uh, the Thanks last a thing, lot. When, Thanks when, everybody when, listening. When I close out the shows, I always ask folks uh, one question, which is, you can answer this however you like, but uh, why do you do what you do? Uh, you mean... In the cows and the heroin shakes, or or now? Well, I guess it's all the same because I want to. <laughs> it, it, it jazzes me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, a, a, any and all. There's no there's no wrong answer to it. I just kind of like to hear. Uh, what oh no, I, I'm still out there in the world fucking with people. I'm just fucking with different people. That's all. <laughs> any uh, any kind of musical something coming down the line? Uh, with well. Everything's virtual now, and I'm a live performer, so no, I, I've kind of put that stuff away. I'm afraid if I start writing music, I'll, you know, the thing about writing a good song is, is, is you make it, and then you want people to hear it, and then you're putting something out, and then you're, you know, you're back on the treadmill again, and, and uh, yeah, like I said, it was 30 years ago, it was never huge, like, who would care? That's how I felt about it over the years. See what I'm saying? Well, you might be surprised, but I get it. And like I told you, music is very expensive emotionally for me to make. And, you know, just selfishly speaking, uh, I I don't see an audience. You know, like you said earlier, we're sort of not talked about even in our own hometowns. (laughs) So... I don't even, I can't even count that I could put something together and fill up the entry anymore, to my knowledge. I don't know. And there's nobody playing in the entry anyway. There's nobody playing anywhere. There's nobody playing anywhere. (laughs) Yeah, 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 exactly. It's a a larger concern than than just the, just Uh, that. Not a lot of motivation to rent out a practice space and put some musicians together who can tolerate me and, and... the other thing is putting together a band now. See, when the cows were invented, we were nobody. Nobody knew who we were. Any band I put together now, everybody's going to know who those people are, and they're going to know that those people aren't crazy. Yeah. People didn't know if we were crazy or not. Nobody knew who we were. <laughs> and, and that's like part. Yeah, and that's can be part of the allure slash part of the overall, uh, you know, legend. Yeah. Of a band. If you start if you start thinking about, well, I saw this guy in five other bands and I've sat down and had coffee with them, you're already <laughs> not in the moment anymore. Yeah, yeah. We talked we talked about Journey at the End of the Night and it was a it was a nice conversation. Okay, well cool, but it doesn't <laughs> it, yeah. it, it removes the allure, I guess, of the uh the wild rock and roll antics. Yeah, I mean we played out and we did fine and, and you know, I miss it, but yeah, it, it, you know, Paul Sanders said, you know, Shannon, we're working pretty hard. Who do you think our audience is? I had to say, you know what? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of lit the steam out of everything. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, 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 it yeah. is what it is. Well, yeah. I, I thank you so much uh, for, for the time. Long live the frontier. And I and, and, uh, thank you for the time, and I thank you for the music, man. This, this is oh, great. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. I had a good time. Thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, you know, it's you. Anytime you want to come back and uh, and chat, man, I'm sure we we, you know, we could probably go. What are for you a doing next Thursday? <laughs> <All right. laughs> exactly, we'll make it a regular thing. <laughs> Thanks so much, Shannon. All right. Thanks a lot. See you, Conan. All right, there he goes. Let's hear a cow. Let's hear a cow song to play us out. Um, let's do hitting the wall. I like that one.
Hitting the wall by the cows. That's Mr. Shannon Selberg and the boys doing what they do. Yeah. That was a good time, man. That was a... That was awesome. What an awesome dude. One of the all-time great uh, front people, too. Very thoughtful. Uh, a thoughtful front person. <laughs> So that was Shannon Selberg, Cows, Heroin Cheeks. You can find their stuff in a place called the Internet. Also, uh, largely these days at uh, various reissues, hand hand done lino cuts by uh, Amphetamine Reptile. The name of this show is Kona New Transportonic Reversal. Thank you very much for listening to it. As we come to the close of our broadcast day. This show airs Thursdays, 8 Eastern, 7 Central, 6 Mountain, 5 Pacific on RadioNope.com. Say yes to no. Archives available at ProtonicReversal.com. Every show. Off, Mr. and Mrs. America, and all the ships at sea. Since the dawn of time. Anyone within the sound of my voice. Patreon.com slash Bertonic Reversal if you want the episode sooner. One dollar a month will get you there. I've got... No ads, no sponsors. 50,000 watts of power. No kidding. Thanks, folks, for uh, sharing the show around, uh, writing reviews, letting people know this is a thing that uh, you should check out. I thank you very much for that. microphone turns sound into electricity. Thank you, Shannon Silver. Can you hear me now? Stay safe out there. Out on Route 128, in the dark and lonely. And take it easy. Got my radio on. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? to my top 10. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. There is no special girl! It's the... It's the end of radio! The last announcer plays the last record! The last what? 
leaves the transmitter, circles the globe in search of a listener. Can you hear me now? broadcasting if there's no one there to receive it's the end of radio as we come to the close of our broadcast day Radio. 